Hey there, Bay Area. This is I Can Talk, and this is Vivian speaking. Today we have Philip Nguyen and Megan Chan uh, with us to talk about the recent AAPI hate and violence, and also the model minority and other topics relating to it. So, Philip, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, um, and hi, everyone who's tuning in to listen today. Uh, to be here with you. Uh, my name is Philip Nguyen. I a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in, in Southern California in this place called Lancaster, California. Uh, both my parents are refugees from of the Vietnam War. They came in the late 80s. And I think, you know, if, if I were to introduce myself, that's that's my that's where my, my origin story begins and that's where my trajectory starts. Um, especially in with respect to the, the topic at hand for today um, on, on Asian American identity and anti-API hate. Um, a little bit about what I do, I uh, I'm an educator. So I teach Asian American studies at uh, UC Berkeley and at San Francisco State University as a lecturer faculty member. Um, in, in my spare time, I also uh, work in several nonprofit organizing spaces. Um, most prominently uh, with the, with the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, I, I do an, an online um, an online show with uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, the Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, I also am the co-chair for the Young Vietnamese Americans Committee for Pivot, the Progressive Vietnamese American Organization. Um, and, and I'm the president of the Union of North American Vietnamese Student Associations, or UNASA. Um, and then bringing it to a more local context, I also was the community, organi community organizing program manager um, for the Vietnamese American Roundtable based in San Jose. That's a lot of titles. And hopefully, you know, through this conversation, we get a little bit more deeply into, I think, how identity shapes who we are and what we do and like how we might find our passion in community too. So, but thank y'all for having me. I'm glad to be here. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, and then Megan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Megan and just to go kind of with the format that Philip had before. Um, so I am half Vietnamese with my mother being from Vietnam. She grew up in like Garden Grove, all that stuff. And what I do here though, I am the external vice president. Oh, sorry. I'm also a graduating senior at San Francisco State where uh, Philip teaches. Um, and I also have a minor in American studies, but I am the external vice president for the Vietnamese Student Association on campus. And for our club, for instance, we strive for our members to feel brave in our space and to advocate for their own voices and beliefs. I am also the marketing assistant for ICANN, as well as work with organizations such as EVAN that Philip had previously stated earlier. Uh, but yeah, great to be here. Thank you. Cool. So I guess I should introduce a little bit about my background as well. Um, I am the marketing and funds development coordinator for ICANN. So anything to do with uh, social media, the flyers and all these th different things. And I am actually a quarter Vietnamese and Chinese. So living in San Jose, born and raised, you are always surrounded by like Asians of different types. So the Asian culture in general was very prominent growing up. Uh, however, I didn't feel the difference between who you grew up with until about like middle school. And I think growing up in San Jose compared to other areas is very different because I feel at least that like our heritage was celebrated a lot more. Yeah, and I think that's a, I mean, just to, I feel like we're going to get right into it, right, Vivian? Um, for, I mean, for me, I, I didn't grow up in a, in a place that was really, like, that's really interesting that you say that, that in San Jose, um, heritage and history were, were celebrated so much more. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, like, grow, growing up. Um, and it's it's really wild now to be in the Bay Area. Um, like, I, I live in Oakland, but I work in San Jose and in San Francisco. Like. Asian Pacific Americans during this month particularly are, are are much more vocal and much more celebrated than I ever had growing up. Um, I grew up around like people like people other people of color, like black folks, Latinx folks, um, like working class white folks. I went to public I've, I've gone to public school all my life, 
And like to also provide more context, Lancaster is, um, I mean, I grew up in a predominantly low income community, right? Like I mentioned, my, my parents were immigrants. So, so trying to find people of Asian, like Asian American or even Vietnamese descent um, outside of my family was very unimaginable, like in Lancaster. And so oftentimes like, sort of like how maybe folks will live in um, in Oakland and go to San Jose for groceries or like have family like across the bay. Um, I, I oftentimes find myself with my family going to Little Saigon in the OC. Um, so we, we would be able to, would be able to get those groceries so my mom can make like um, her recipes that she brought from from Vietnam, right? And like really, um, and I think in that way, like pass on the culture uh, to to me and my younger sister. Um, but what about you, Megan? What about um, where you so grew actually up? I grew up in San Jose, so South Bay. Um, it's interesting because I think there was a sense of trying to separate. Well, my mom, she left um, SoCal kind of to get away from family. Um, and so there was a part of that that took me out of the culture as well. Um, like I never was taught Vietnamese and we never went to the festivals that happened literally down the street from my house. Um, so growing up, I actually identified more with my Chinese side um, because my dad actively tried to get me involved with a lot of the events and cultural aspects. But I don't speak Cantonese, so he didn't try that hard, I guess. Um, uh, but going into San Francisco State, I took I took Isabel's class, Isabel Polo's class, and I started to think like more of what being Vietnamese means to me. And it kind of like, just snowballed from there. Um, like I started the Vietnamese Student Association with my best friend Anvo and Beyond Live. Um, and yeah, I've just become so immersed in the culture and now I'm just so happy to find feel like part of the space. Yeah, I had similar experience. Um, well, my my mom is full Chinese, but she was born in Vietnam. Um, I'm a quarter on my father's side, um, but I didn't have very much interaction with him. I think that's very similar to a lot of like Asian families where it's like the dad is either just not there or you just don't interact very much with them. Um, but I also grew up predominantly kind of in the Chinese community. So I know I know and technically understand like three dialects of Chinese and I'm just recently getting more into my Vietnamese side. But because my family was born in Vietnam, um, they kind of mix a lot of things. And actually one of our family dialects, Biu Q, is very common with Vietnamese, Chinese, Americans. Um, there's a lot of different sub dialects from that as well, where you could have like an Asian accent or people move to like other countries. So they have like that kind of accent. But within San Jose, it's actually very common for that specific Chinese within Vietnamese, or Chinese um, Americans. Um, and as I was growing up, it was always very clear the difference between American and Asian. And even from there, it was even more, maybe not more clear, but it was always kind of said like, there's a difference between Chinese and Vietnamese too. Um, and that's a whole other thing to go into, but just kind of pertaining to what we were talking to, growing up in San Jose, you would see a lot of like the, you know, Lunar New Year festivities um, in the Vietnamese town area, or you would go to the Vietnamese market around like Milpitas. Um, and I remember every weekend going with my parents, uh, my mom and my grandparents to go grocery shopping. It was a whole day activity because you had to go jump from one Asian store to another to get exactly what you needed. And sometimes it would be in Milpitas, sometimes it would be like uh, on the east side of San Jose or whatever. And I remember very clearly in middle school talking about doing this with my family 
and my more um, Americanized friends, because a lot of my friends were half, um, they were either half Asian, half white, or like full white or whatever. And they were like, why do you do that? Like, it was so strange for them to hear of me spending time with my family to just go grocery shopping. Right, and, and I think that's, I mean, I feel like when we talk about Asian American identity, it like oftentimes in the mainstream, like we see it as a lunchbox moment, right? Like you're eating something at lunch in the cafeteria at school that you brought from home that you packed in like that reused plastic container. Um, and it's like food that your mom made, like she worked like hours to make. And then you feel like you need to throw it away because other people think it like smells weird or whatever. It has too much new mom in it, right? And so I feel like I, I also like share a similar sentiment, right? Where like folks saw me differently, not only because of how I looked, but because of the different, like the way that I acted. And oftentimes I felt myself feeling like I needed to hide that or change who I was because I wasn't American enough, right? And I think at the, at the same time that I, I myself didn't feel American enough like at school or in the outside world, um, I, I never really truly felt like Vietnamese or like part of my family at home, right? Because like I, I didn't really, wasn't able to speak like Vietnamese very well, right? Like there were words that they, I couldn't understand. There, like I don't really remember when are the days of all the death anniversaries and all the cultural holidays that we're supposed to celebrate, right? And it almost feels like in both spaces I'm like a different language. Um, and, and I feel like, I mean, this the story of the grocery store and you know, like, what I'm thinking about now is, you know, how we how we tie our, the way that we grew up into this, this contemporary moment, right? When Asian Americans are seen as lesser than, as like less than human, and not only as less than human, but as like the, the causes of, you know, this um, this global pandemic, right? Um, and and it's really interesting, like between between the three of us, right? Whether we grew up in a place with um, a lot of Vietnamese, Chinese, Asian American people or not. We're really being seen as the flu, right? The China virus, the the Wuhan flu, the virus, right? Like there are so many of these um, these these terms and these derogatory terms and phrases are, are 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 placed upon us, right? This idea that we are are the cause of something like this, and that way, and that justifies um, violence against not only us, but like our most vulnerable populations, our elders, right? Um, well, I, I think we'll we'll get there. Um, I mean, I, I think before before we get to the point where we're thinking about how we uh, have been seen as the virus, I feel like in that same sort of way, um, there's a like I don't know if y'all feel this, but like at the same time that I felt like I was an outsider, I also felt like um, there were certain benefits, right, or like privileges that were ascribed to me because of the way that I look, right, like teachers gave me a pass or like I, I was, you know, they thought I would be um, like do well on certain assignments because I was like, I looked this sort of way and there weren't other, other Asians that looked this kind of way. And I, you know, there's so much discussion now about what the model minority stereotype means. And so I wanted to kind of see like, you know, growing up in San Jose where there are a bunch of like other um, Asian Americans, Asian American, in, in an Asian American community, like how, what was that experience like for you? I mean, for me, like, I think most Asians do well in school because if you don't do well in school, you go home and you're going to get beat, right? Like, I think that's a lot of, I don't know what contributed, but that's kind of what helps support the idea, at least to the people who don't live in our culture. <laughs> why we're considered a model minority and why we always have our work done because if you don't do it you will not be successful and that's why our parents push us so hard to do well in school but for me it was very much funny because everyone knew that i could do like math right oh asians can do math i can do the work but it will take me two times longer than other people to complete it because I just, number one, do not like math. And a lot of times I just don't understand it very well. I see numbers and I fall asleep. However, I do very well in writing. 
and art and all those different things, which are not exactly pushed as a good thing in Asian culture because those aren't stable. And that's a lot of the reason why like Asians don't go into those um, careers, those positions, because parents and families are too afraid of the instability of those careers to push their kids. And knowing this and experiencing it actually affected how I ended up like, even going to college and of what people expected of me. I did really well in writing, but I went to school for business. Obviously, I did not pursue that, but um, it it is funny how the model minority or even like the model child in the culture can really affect your future and how it plays out. Right, and, and I think, I think it's, I mean, it has something to do with, you mentioned it, like being a, or alluding to being a refugee and immigrant background, right? Like not only are we, are we balancing parental expectations, but societal expectations as well. And I, I think how we understand who we are in the world, right? Versus how like the world understands us to like be like, you know, we're expected to be a doctor, a lawyer, a business person. Um, and we're not, right? We're really seen as like, you know, the, the um, like Panda Express or like all these other like very, um, you know, very hurtful stereotypes, right? And so that are, that are based on the way that we look um, and nothing else. I think um, another thing as we talk about this, this idea of the modern minority stereotype, and I think this might be like the Asian American, like the studies part of me that's coming out, but you know, we have to see it as a way that, that different um, systems and structures of power and hierarchy um, are being leveraged to benefit white supremacy, right? Like the way that we are pitted against other um, like black indigenous people of color, right? Um, really impacts what our position is in the community and how we practice, um, how we can possibly practice like solidarity with one another, right? Like what does that mean? Um, and, and to really see like, you know, it's really easy to make some modern minority stereotype, right? Like a lot of people might see a good stereotype, right? That Asians are, are doing well, like they have nothing to worry about, but and but at the same time, that you know that prevents us from um, opening up those opportunities to work with other people of color who we've been pitted against, right? Because as we are a model minority, that means that there are folks that are less than model, right? Um, not only are we are we seen as a model, but we're seen as a monolithic group um, that all Asians are the same, right? In the same way that we're 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 benefiting from this I, this myth of meritocracy, right? We know that other folks don't have the same privilege to be able to um, leverage meritocracy for like social and a, a social mobility, right? And so there are so many different different facets of of a minority stereotype that be really insidious and break bonds not only um, across you know different different people of color but for ourselves internally, right? Like when we internalize the modern minority stereotype and we internalize this idea that we need to be who our parents expect us to be, as well as against or be who society wants us to be, you know, that causes a lot of mental health um, issues and struggles for folks in the second generation, right? And, and I wanna say like, at the same time that this is APA Heritage Month and APA History Month, um, it's also Mental Health Awareness Month, which is something that we are, that is not uncommon um, in San Jose, and especially for Asian American, and particularly Southeast Asian American, right? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off that with just like my own experience. Just like growing up, it's like you don't only have societal like expectations of you, but family, familial ones too. So I honestly felt a lot of burnout, and I just didn't know what to choose going into college. So I just chose business. You know, like it was the very easy choice. It was something that fit the stereotype that I was playing into. And then going into college and realizing all the different avenues that I could be going down. Um, I, I would say I regret my college experience because I played into the minority stereotype. I kind of let it happen. Um, but yeah, it's when you see how much like, not animosity, but a little bit of that between all the bi POC communities. And when you realize at the end of the day that the person who set it up is white supremacy and the oppression and the power of the oppressed and it's just like we have to help start to dismantle that and to be 
in solidarity with our other people of color. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, on, on like further more from, from Megan's point, right? Like not only about white supremacy, but other systemic and structural barriers to um, like going back to this idea of what it means to be American, right? Um, and, and what it means to be seen as un-American. Um, and at the same time, like not see yourselves as an American, right? Like three like overlapping circles. Um, you know, bringing it back to San Jose, which which has the most Vietnamese people in the diaspora um, that are from Vietnam in one city, right? <clears throat> um, the modern minority skews the issues that we face, right? Like when Vietnamese people are conflated with all the other Asians, right? And because we're Asian, we're doing Asian, we're doing well. We really aren't seeing that. Um, in terms of like, for example, things like health disparities, that COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic most heavily impacted um, the Vietnamese and the Filipino communities, right? And so like, we we oftentimes like in the community, we talk about disaggregating the data or like how dangerous aggregation of data is, right? And so like if, you know, and I think this is what this makes this conversation a little beautiful, like it's beautiful is that like, we're hopefully shedding light into a bunch of issues that people wouldn't have thought about otherwise, right? Yeah, and then even going off of the disaggregated data, um, this is this is coming from our website for I Can Inspire Scholarship. Only 27% of Vietnamese adults over 25 years of age hold at least a four-year college degree. Compared to Indians with 70%, Koreans with 53%, Chinese with 51%, Filipinos with 47%, and Japanese with 46%. Even though Vietnamese is like one of the largest uh, like Asian groups within the community, only 27% have college degrees over the age of 25. And yet, when people look at us, they automatically assume, oh, you went to college, you are privileged enough to be able to do well in school, when in reality, the data, this is from 2018, does not say that at all. Right, and, and I think, I mean, that's also what, um, so at SF State, we have a, you know, why I want to highlight the work that um, BSA SFSU does, as well as AAMPI student services at San Francisco State, particularly because we're we're looking. We have grant funding from um, the NFPZ, or I don't I forget what NFPZ stands for, but it's it's this um, institutional grant funding that allows community-based organizations or groups within the institution to be able to do direct outreach to folks with respect to um, educational opportunity and entertainment, right? Like, because there is this misconception that we are in college, that we're like going for these, you know, we're at these elite institutions, these IVs, and, you know, we think about like this, this fight for affirmative action, things like that, right? And how we're being pitted against other folks against affirmative action, right? Um, as a state, what we're doing is we're trying to focus on retention, right? Like, what, what do people need holistically or what do students holistically need um, in addition to academic support, right, that would be able to, um, one, help, allow them to foster and find a community for themselves because, you know, Megan can maybe speak to this, but being able to find folks that you don't have to explain anything to becomes really powerful, right, because they become your, um, your support system, especially if you come from um, broken families, right, if, especially if you come from a family where you felt like an outsider, right, um, especially if you come from you know, a place where you we were able to find that support, and then also um, be able to provide different infrastructures that are outside of you know, like we're just going to be able to go to um, a tutoring session that the university hosts, and then that's going to be all that we need, right? Like I think there's something to be said about being able to see people that look like you as your role models, as people in the community that are doing the things that you aspire to also be doing, right? Um, so that you can feel like there's a space for you that you don't need to you know, work so hard to carve out a space. And in that same way, I think, you know, we're, we're definitely building the boat as we as we float it, right? But the way that we, we see ourselves in community with one another and how we're doing what we can to, um, you know, rectify some of the hurt um, and, and do that community healing 
that's a result of the things like the model minority stereotype or the perpetual foreigner stereotype or being seen as a yellow peril, right? Um, you know, we, we can look forward to. But Megan, I don't know, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to the community at SF State. Um, and, and also, like maybe also the community that you're finding now, like through ICANN and your work in the Vietnamese American community, because I, I think it's not just about being with people that look like you, but like the work that you do together, right? Yeah, yeah. I, it's becoming like a San Francisco State kind of advocacy over here, but no, it is true. Like being in a space that I, when I was mentioning the model minority and perpetual foreign uh, ideas to certain people, sometimes they, I do need to explain and it is, I always get surprised because for me, it was something I learned in my intro AS class that I took like, the freshman year. And so like when I'm in the spaces such as with VSA and at conferences and summits for them, um, being able to go further in conversation and to delve deeper into our identities and the way society works, it's so powerful because then you become your own advocate, which is so important, um, which is what I can does. Um, that's our work. We make sure that all parents and children start to feel powerful in themselves and to feel that they can advocate for their own beliefs and their own ideas. And that's why I feel like also with San Francisco State, especially with BSA, um, I definitely have like a found family in that sense. Like a lot of us have our shared experiences and also similar educational backgrounds now with taking Asian American classes and being exposed to all these ideas in these classrooms that we are allowed and are encouraged to explore and we are given the materials resources and the professors such as philip is always so like they're so there for, like they're so present for their students and they want to hear them because that's what a community needs is to be heard um not by just um the, like the rest of society but within because there is so much hurt as philip had mentioned there's so much hurt like in our community that we need to heal um, before we can keep moving forward and pushing our, just pushing to a better future. Yeah, I guess that's like, that's what I could say. <laughs> right, I mean, thanks thanks for that, Megan. I mean, shout outs to, to everything that you're doing um, over there and, you know, congrats on almost graduating. And I think, I wanna, I wanna bring, it, bring it back to the South Bay, right? Bringing it back to the work that we're doing in San Jose, um, like, one of the things that I feel like I try to embody is that, you know, the work doesn't just happen in Asian American studies classes, right? Like, it's not just about what classes you take and, and who, um, like what, what role you play, right? Or, or um, you know, how far you've gotten in your education, but to really see all, all of us like in community, right? Like not only us who have, the, have been able to go to college and, and get an education, but the elders, our elder generation, like the refugees, immigrants that came here and provided for us and, and sacrificed everything for us to be able to get this education, right? As well as folks that are like up and coming, right? That are now learning through the issues, through medium, social media, like there's a lot of TikTok advocacy going on. And so like thinking about what advocacy looks like and what it, how it um, impacts our communities, right? I really do think about I in, in, in the South Bay, in San Jose, and I think about VAR, and I think about um, the VAC, and I think about the newly, um, that, that's going to be opening Vietnamese American Service Center, right? Like, we took the data and we took, the, well, we took the disaggregated data, and we took the narratives of people in our communities, and we amplified them, right? As, as much as the, the community, or not the community, but the mainstream wants to um, shed, the mainstream wants to portray us as voiceless victims, right? We know that we have always had a voice, right? We know that Vietnamese people are loud as hell, right? And and what what these organizations like VAR, ICANN, um, Vivo, I mean, even like the VSA spaces, right? Are doing is that they're providing a, we're providing ourselves a platform for other people to hear us out, right? And for us to really get people to commit to action in our communities, right? Like, what is it that we can do to fight against um this disparately high rate of COVID-19 infections and death right like what is it that we're doing to protect our elders from anti-API hate um and what they're experiencing in their own homes right and like places like Little Saigon which they've always they've called home since they like left their homes in Vietnam right the other thing I I would like to I guess point out um related to what you're talking about is how surprised 
the non-Asian community is about it. They're so shocked that we have faced discrimination and um, bias and racism when in reality it hasn't just been happening the past few years or even like when Trump started. It has been happening for years and years throughout history and it just hasn't really been as well conversed as it has been now. Yeah, I just wanted to go go into now like the perpetual foreigner idea. I mean, we can trace back racism and violences against the Asian community all the way back to the gold rush era uh, with the Chinese workers. Um, there was uh, the Rock Springs uh, massacre, for instance, in the 1800s. Um, and that was the idea that the Chinese were taking jobs from the white um, population in, in California. And that's what it just boiled up. And that's what ended up happening. I believe 20 workers were killed during that event. And it's just continued from there because, um, say for instance, the Chinese community offered a cheaper sense of labor because they needed the money to send back to their families due to um, the past wars that have ravaged their country. Um, that's why they came here to find jobs, to get money, to survive, only to be portrayed as this perpetual foreigner that you do not belong, that you cannot be here, and therefore we will do something about it. Um, so that idea has really been just, just like taken all the way down, but then it was almost glossed over with the model minority that saying, you are the good minority here, you are um, worth something almost, but there's still always been that underlying racism and um, hatred towards our community because we are seen as a threat, uh, which is also goes into the yellow peril idea that uh, Philip mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah, that all like well, all of those things have culminated into these balances that have been happening, um, especially in this last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what was it? Over 3,500 cases have been reported, I believe, at this point. Be more. But yeah, it's just, you can really go all the way back and see it. Right, and, and we can, um, I mean, all those things are interconnected, right? And they intersect with so many other parts of our identity and how we come to become who we are, <clears throat> right? Um, and then we, I wanna just, you know, thinking about Asian, like the, the term Asian American, right? And where that comes from, it wasn't just that, you know, if you drove a Honda Civic and drink boba at, you know, wherever it is in San Jose, like, I, I like Seven Leaves, but um, it, it wasn't just about like the things you did that, or how you ascribe that, that made you Asian American, right? Like you weren't just described as Asian American because of how you looked, because really if, if people talked about how you looked, um, they would call you an Oriental or a chink or a goop or et cetera, et cetera, right? The, the, the term Asian American was a political term that started in 1968, 69, at the onset of the founding of ethnic studies at, uh, with the Third World Liberation Front, right? And Asian American students really were the ones that came together and, and formed this sort of political identity, right? Like that they were going to contest all of these, um, do what they could to, to act against these, these different things that shrouded and skewed the ways that we are, we all are oppressed in, uh, um, with alongside other communities, right? To see ourselves as part of the third world, to see ourselves in the efforts of the indigenous folks, right? Um, black folks, Latinx folks, like, as well as folks that were fighting for their their own liberation from, from oppressors and from colonizers around the world, right? And that's not to say, I mean, this idea of the modern minority also skews the the oppression that we face, right? And and I know, like, you know, I, I wanna be really careful of um, playing playing oppression Olympics, right? Like we need to know that oppression happens in, in tandem with one another across different communities, right? Um, but we also can't ignore the fact or, in, you know, invisibilize the experiences of Asian Americans who, um, for example, right? Refugees coming to the United States after the end of the Vietnam War, um, there wasn't a really positive reception for, for refugees, right? From Vietnam or from Southeast Asia. Like what the United States did was disperse refugee communities across the United States, 
so that we wouldn't be able to like build communities with each other because you know when you have a bunch of refugees coming into one place like it's going to bring the property values down and not only that but like people just didn't want to see people that reminded them of that war where they lost so many of their their sons and brothers and fathers right um so that's one example another example might be like even after resettlement of refugees in the united states right we see the kkk and shrimp fishermen in in the south right the u.s south um fighting against one another right there's so much racial tension there and there's so much um and and it kind of boils down to we're seen as a yellow pepper Peril. We're seen as a potential foreigner in the yellow peril because we're seen as the people who are taking the jobs away from people who are American, right? That we aren't American and therefore we don't deserve the same rights and the, to be able to live our livelihoods in the same way as as quote unquote real Americans do, right? And so not only you know when when Vietnamese shrimpers came into the United States in the South and were able to um, you know, find their livelihood that way and, and get killed as a result of it because of this racial tension, right? We think also about 1982, I think, um, in the 1980s when Vincent Chin was murdered because people felt like, uh, you know, the damn gaps were coming in and like taking over uh, the, the automotive industry, right? Um, days before his wedding. And so there is, you know, and I think speaking to Megan's point and, and also, um, how we see this recent trend in AAPIA as as not an isolated incident, right? Like it wasn't just about one bad day that some person had, but it's really this series of historical events and con contexts that have led up to this moment where now we're finally um, heard in the mainstream, right? Um, and even like, you know, when we think about things like, and I, I and I'm gonna pass it back to y'all after this, but like, I'm, I'm gonna try to pop off, right? Like when we think about things like police brutality, right? like um, the way we, we understand the police and the way that community safety works, right? Um, we, I think about the shooting of Tommy Lay in Seattle, right? Like who was shot because he was, he was holding a pen, right? Um, and, I, and I think about the shooting of uh, Jan Pibitgal, right? In, in San Jose, um, who was shot because she was holding a vegetable peeler, right? It's not ever, you know, we have to be able to see oppression. We have to see these issues like in community with one another and really be able to like understand that when we talk about like defunding the police or abolishing the police or doing or having police reform, right? We're not just talking about any singular community, but we're talking about like the ways in which we have been racialized to be seen as other and to be seen as foreigner and to be seen as um, less than human, right? Kind of going off of that, but on a more personal note, I would like to hear if you guys are comfortable with any, I guess, examples of bias or racism that have affected your life. Maybe it doesn't have to be very blatant, like the name calling or being very specifically targeted, but kind of how the model minority or perpetual foreigner have been so ingrained that people don't even realize that this is negatively affecting our community. So for example, as an Asian woman, you are always constantly seen as small and docile. Like they do not expect that you will fight back at all, that you can be a leader that you can be anything but submissive. So there have been times where uh, I remember going to Santa Cruz, going from a very predominantly Asian area in San Jose to a predominantly white area in Santa Cruz for school. I was sitting on the bus and the guy behind me decided it would be okay to take a chunk of my hair and sniff it because he, knew that I wouldn't say anything, so. Uh, oh, <laughs> just, I, uh, there's like two instances, like one that's more, uh, not one instance, but it's kind of sum summarized my high school experience. I still hadn't like fully felt part of my, like felt a part of the Asian American community. So like a lot of my friends were white, um, which is surprising because my school was predominantly uh, Asian. But I felt that I didn't belong because you know, I didn't speak the language. I wasn't, I didn't feel connected to my culture. Um, and a lot of times I would suppress parts of myself 
just to fit into the white cult, like in with my white friends. Um, I felt that like I was distancing myself from my actual interests and saying what I actually thought. So I never said anything. I was always pretty quiet about my beliefs and things like that until like my final year of high school when I finally became really good friends with um, my current one of my current best friends. Like she's Chinese, and I was like, I can be like who I want to be. Like this, I could be this person. Um, but also like kind of recent. Ish. It was in college. I was on the bus, and I was just like, you know, standing there, like, on the bus, waiting for it to move. And this guy, like, he's like, oh, like, hi. I was like, okay, hi. And then he asked me my bra size, like, just straight up asked me, and I couldn't say anything. I was in such shock, and like, I could tell that he asked me that because he knew I was saying, or I would, you know, just take it. Um, that was something. I remember speeding off the bus. Luckily, I was where I was、um, at the mall, so like I just ran in there and hid just in case he followed me afterwards. And that's like a thing that a lot of Asian women have to be. It's a lot of women in general, but especially Asian women with the fetishization of us, you know, especially in media. You know, obviously, you know, this is a long spiel, but. Um, as the dragon lady, but also as the、um, like in Madam Butterfly, we were just we need that to be saved. We need to be loved. The idea,、um, and if we're strong, we're seen as a bad person. So there's always that.、Um, but yeah, that was like my instances of you know being quiet and docile. I just let myself be walked over a lot of times. So. There's always that, but I'm trying to work on that, and that's why I think our community here is like we can be strong and beautiful. Like there is so much beauty and strength. Yeah. Thank you both for for sharing, you know, those parts of yourself with with me and with everyone who's listening to us. And you all are, you are, you both are strong and beautiful, and are doing the work that we and our community need, right? As as activists and as advocates,、um, to to shed light on these issues and to share your personal experience. Um, to to do so, I I think, I mean, as you know, on the topic of strong, resilient, like Vietnamese American or like Asian American women,、um, I think about my mom, and I I want to just hi- like take a moment to highlight her, and you know, in, I think in Vietnamese there's this there's this phrase rank you right, like do whatever you can, like keep your head down and like push through, right, and like eventually you're gonna be able to like make it, right, or like. Whatever your your good fortune or your karma that you accrue is going to pass into the next generation.、Um, like my mom worked in a nail salon, and and so that's really like. And I grew up at the nail salon. Like she was picking me up from school and I'd hang out there, right? And that's that's sort of really where I began to see like what transformative like racial solidarity could look like. Even though I didn't have the words to words then, right? Like she worked at a nails, which is in like a Walmart. Um, in like a low-income area, right? So like the the clientele that she had were like,、um, you know, very very diverse. And when I think about the, so so more recently, you know, through the pandemic, I I got my mom into playing Pokemon Go, right? And so sometimes we would go down to like the boulevard and like we walk back up and down, and like up and down, so we'd be able to like catch a bunch of Pokemon and like get all the Pokestops along the way, right? You spend these Pokestops that are at different locations. And and just as recent as last week, you know, I I was talking to my mom on the phone, and she was saying like, oh yeah, like、um, me and your dad are, you know, we're afraid, right? Like, and this is crazy to me because I I don't, you know, my my parents aren't afraid of anything, right? Like they're superheroes, they're gonna like rank you and just get through it because that's what they've always done. Like they're afraid because of the way that they look, right? Because they're Asians, they don't know if like any like while they're walking and just playing Pokemon Go, minding their own business in a public area. Um, that anyone's gonna like come up and just like push them, right? Or like beat them up, or like any like, you know, like commit violence against them. And I'm really thinking about like, damn, like how how horrible do you have to be to like commit? Like you woke up and you chose to be violent to like my mom and like my dad and like my grandparents that day, right? Like it's not like that's just fucked up, right? Like at the end of the day, excuse my language, but that's just fucked up, right? And I think that's, you know, that's just. Bits and pieces, like what I think of of what we're feeling all together as a community now, right? Like how 
this violence has occurred historically and it has, has been um, apparent or is becoming apparent in so many other realms of our lives and, and just our day to day that, you know, it's, it's time for us to speak up, right? Like we need to speak up because we haven't been heard yet. And like, this is the platform that we're gonna be using to make sure that people know that we aren't silent, right? That we have a voice and we're gonna use it to like help one another, right? So I mean, I just wanna thank you both for, for sharing your, um, your experience and insight into that. Thank you. And then going off of what you were saying as well, the fact that they're ta attacking the elderly, two things, how, how badly do you need to feel about yourself? How small do you need to feel about yourself to attack the elderly, that, number one? And number two, I found it kind of interesting or kind of strange, at least for me, how shocked or how weirded out some of the non-Asian community was about how the Asian community was getting very offended that our elderly were being attacked. I think they don't understand the connection that we have to our like grandparents on this, where a lot of times because our parents were the ones going out and, you know, bringing home the bacon pretty much, like making money, trying to survive, we were either raised by our grandparents or just Asian culture in general has this kind of reverence to the elderly as like our leaders and as like advisors and people that we should be respecting and have lived through hell and back. Yeah, like how, how low do you have to go to have to attack an older person? Like they literally have no defense or anything that like most of the same how with his, with his parents. Like I don't live at home currently right now and I'm always worried because my dad will just randomly go out because he just needs to go out and walk or something. And I'm always worried that something's gonna happen. And even though he he speaks English fully, he, you know, he's lived in America most of his life. He was, even though he was born in Hong Kong, he grew up here since he was five, especially in San Francisco. So he's like very liberal and he knows a lot of these things. But people see him and they see an Asian person. They don't see anything beyond that. They just see them as see us as a thing. Um, not having that much emotion behind it. It's just kind of like as we say, like as a model of a minority of the minority. And that that is just why it's it's, it's like we've always been so quiet and now we're saying stuff. Um it's just oh, I get lost my train of thought right there. But yeah, it's just always so scary to think about um, my family going out or my family, my friend's family going out. Um, especially for this, a lot of them don't speak English. Um, they don't quite, sometimes they don't quite understand why this has been happening. I mean, but yeah, I was thought that was a very good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and I, I think that's, that's totally in line with what we're talking about, right? Like between, and also like between um, VAR and, and ICANN, right? Like we do work with the elder communities, with the refugees and immigrants like here. And we see them as a source of knowledge, right? Like we revere and respect our elders because they're the ones that, you know, went sacrifice and struggle and strife to be able, for us to be able to, to have the opportunity that we have, right? And we recognize that and we try to bring them into what we do in terms of community organizing and um, intergenerational healing and things like that. Right? And so I, I think it's very, for the folks that are, 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 are are targeting our elders, like those, our loved ones, right? Like people in our families, like I think it's pitiful, right? Like I very, I really think it's like very pitiful and I, I feel sorry for those people that feel like that's an okay thing to do, um, just based on the way that people look, right? And and just based on their their misception of who we are as people and, and, and how we quote unquote have contributed to like this pandemic that we're all suffering from, right? Um, and you know, and I think this is something that has got to stop. Um, and this is something that I think we're going to have to work through um, as we continue to get our vaccinations, as we kind of reestablish what a new normal for our world looks like, right? When we transition from having virtual conversations to in-person conversations, like how we're going to be able to keep each other safe um, and how we're going to be able to uh, continue to build our community and build strength in our community so that the younger generation have 
the tools that they feel for the tools that they need to speak up against the sort of violence for for our elders, right? Because oftentimes like our monolingual elders are like Vietnamese speaking, like parents and grandparents, like they're not gonna be able to like go on a live stream like this or a podcast or whatever, what have you, right? And like share their own experience. It's really gonna be up to us and, and the folks that are coming after us to, um, to feel empowered to be able to take action, right? And like inspire others to take action. Um, I, I, I feel like I know we're running a little bit up on time, but I mean, a couple of, I mean, a couple of plugs from me and from VAR. I mean, I just want to highlight by the good work that um, BSAs are doing across across North America, across the world to, to really bring to attention like anti-API hate and other issues that are, are relevant to us multi-generationally. Um, and then also VAR, I mean, we're, we're working with ICANN, we're working with local Vietnamese. Um, Vietnamese and API community folks to put together our uh, student edu engagement and education for development and success or seeds program, right? Because we really want to be able to, to plant the seeds and then cultivate them for, um, for folks in our community to feel as though they have voice. Because again, you know, like we're loud, you know, and we our tradition and our history is based on oral storytelling. And, and we need to be the ones that tell our story and not let others tell that story, right? Um, and so we definitely, I mean, between the two of our organizations have have so much programming and so much um, going on. I mean, through API History Month, APA Heritage Month, but also through the rest of the year and then the right? I'll pass it back to you. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you, number one, for coming on and helping us with this podcast and also with all the work you do as an educator, as a leader in the Vietnamese community, VAR and all the other like work you've been doing. Uh, we have previously worked together on some projects, uh, especially with like census and everything. And I am appalled to say, I did not know how much work you had been doing besides that. So I am thoroughly, impressed and like bowing down to you on that <laughs> um yeah and then as for i can some of the plugs that we have you can find all of our different projects and programs on our website we're currently still accepting uh, applications for our scholarship like i mentioned earlier only 27 percent of vietnamese adults over 25 currently hold a college education of four years uh, of a four-year college degree my bad um, so please apply for that become a college student it is an experience like no other and you will find success and fulfillment in school if you do not find it elsewhere <laughs> um, we also have humanitarian projects we funded, uh, fundraised a lot of money to send help for the floods in Vietnam last year. And we also have a lot of family programs. We are always taking registration and we have a lot of youth programs, all these different things. Please check it out. Uh, Megan, would you like to plug in any of your nonprofit uh, VSAs? Yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I am part of ICANN, so you guys did everything, but uh, for any of the listeners who are going to San Francisco State or trying to think of uh, where to go, I would strongly, I would say San Francisco State because you can really grow into yourself and be able to explore your identity. Um, there's so many amazing people that you'll meet, especially just from like your peers and your professors. Um, you really will open up uh, as I did. Like I was never quite as vocal as I am now, and that's why I'm so excited to be in these spaces to really push those who feel that you know they haven't been heard and that they do have a lot to say. They just don't know how to say it. You need like time. You need those just resources, information to get your voice out there. You have a lot to say. It's just a matter of being able to do it. Um, so if you do go to San Francisco State, definitely take some of uh, a lot of AS classes. They are so amazing and you'll probably require to take them. But also join the Vietnamese Student Association or whatever uh, club that you think you most closely identify with. Um, 
can just see all the amazing work that your peers and that you can do and make the, be the change that you want to see is basically um, it's kind of leading up to you now. And and again, I mean, thank you both so much for, for having me on this this program, um, for allowing me to, to learn a little bit more about you, you two as well. I mean, y'all are hella inspiring and doing work that I teach in the classroom, right? And are the ones that are inspiring my students to, to, to really take that change and be the change that they want to see in the world that Megan um, so articulately mentioned, right? And so, I mean, thank you for, for what you all do. And, you know, hopefully, you know, this really gets to the ears of people who are going to join us. Yeah, I mean, right, as we as we imagine what a, a brighter and better future is going to look like. I should also remember, Philip's also our club advisor, so you can just see how amazing our club is if Philip is our club advisor. So he's not only doing all this work, but also being our club advisor, always giving us tips and giving us shout outs, and it's amazing. So thank you, Philip, for always doing what you're doing. Um, yeah, of course, like you, it's amazing all the work that you've done. We, me and my board members always wonder how you have time to like, sleep or even eat or breathe, really. It's amazing. But also as you're being um, so young and so and doing so much good like so much work and being like such a pivotal like such a big part I can it's like really inspiring for me to see that like I feel like there's always that stereotype or like that idea that like I'm young and so like my um, the higher ups really won't listen to me but being able to work with someone who is close to my age um, has really been empowering especially because then I can do it. I, I feel like I'm also being heard in that as a team member. So yeah. So thank you for being too. I think everyone listening on the podcast should know Philip and I are blushing now. Wow. <laughs> Gotta but, hype you guys up for all the good work you do. And I should say that Megan is like a godsend. Like she does so much work. Um, if you are following our social media like anything with the Instagram a lot of like the campaigns and stuff Megan has been a lot of the brains behind it so thank you for all the work you do um (laughs) (laughs) what is this part (laughs) this is Asians empowering other Asians which we should be doing also like you we should be empowering each other on this not just speaking out on the violence we should be spreading a lot of the positivity as well so i hope that ending it on this note will help our community have a little bit more of a happy positive vibe going into their day as well so thank you very much everyone for listening this was i can talk and we hope that you'll listen in next week as well bye